Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you very much. And our next speaker uh, will also uh, show us how actually you can modernize the development and, and, and really reactivate legacy uh, data using uh, GraphQL. So how you can plug directly uh, some technologies to maybe uh, modern, modern, modernize uh, legacy companies. Hello, uh, Tanamai, how are you? Hey, Mary, how are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Uh, we're kind of a few minutes late, but uh, we will keep your 25 minutes live. Uh, so can you share your screen? I with can the, just give me a quick the third button. button that looks like yeah. a screen. <laughs> All right, can you folks see? Yeah, we can see. Can you go uh, present mode? Perfect, and we're really glad to have a demo of uh, yeah how it's about legacy industries this conference. So yeah, how to modernize legacy industries is uh, in interesting for everybody. Enjoy this stage for 25 minutes. Thanks, Mandy. Hey, everybody. Uh, so happy to be here. Uh, I'm Tamay Gopal. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Hasura. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with GraphQL. And so today, what I'm going to talk to you about is in kind of three stages, right? The first thing I'm going to do is introduce GraphQL to you a little bit uh, and kind of the pros and cons of GraphQL itself as, as a new API specification, right? So GraphQL is at the same layer as SOAP, REST, and now we have GraphQL. So I'm going to introduce GraphQL to you a little bit first. And I'm going to talk about a few use cases on you know, why it's helping modernize development and activate legacy data. And towards the end, I'm going to end with a quick demo of the work that we are doing in this space to help you uh, activate legacy data you know, using, uh, using our open source engine uh, that gives you instant GraphQL APIs on, uh, on your data sources. So, um, so, so just to kind of set some context, uh, Hasura is an open source GraphQL engine. Uh, it connects to databases like Postgres and soon other databases as well. You can connect it to REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, and kind of becomes this unified GraphQL API that you can use. Um, it's open source Apache license, so you can run it as a Docker container in your own infrastructure. And if you just want to kick the tires or you have a project uh, that is you know, net new, maybe you're connecting to a new database, uh, you can also use uh, our uh, cloud solution where uh, Hasura is managed. Uh, but do check us out on GitHub, take it for a spin, uh, and you know, always feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions whatsoever uh, uh, about Hasura, about GraphQL, or anything at all. So with that said, let us get started with GraphQL. So um, uh, uh, also, if I if, uh, uh, would love to kind of hear how many of you are already familiar with GraphQL, or if you've just heard of GraphQL, or if you've never heard of GraphQL, just feel free to let me know in chat. Uh, so that I can also kind of get a sense of uh, you know what what your GraphQL journey has been like. But in the meantime, let me get started with introducing GraphQL to you. Right. So um, GraphQL is a uh, uh, to, to kind of understand GraphQL. Let's take a look at a usual API call. Right. So you know, let's say we're building an application, or we're providing uh, our developers, our development team, an API so that they can go and use that to build an application. And let's say for that application page, they need to build something like uh, you know, they need to build a user profile page or something, right? And so they need to make a get API call typically, uh, and they'll say something like you know slash user ID equal to one, and they'll get a JSON response that gives them you know ID equal to one and name and name as a value, right? So this is nice. This is kind of what what we've been doing, right? Um, and uh, and and now let's say you want some more data. So you, you don't just want this user's ID and name, but you also want the user's profile information. Maybe you want the user's address to show them their latest address, right? Um, and so you make another API endpoint, right? Uh, and you have API slash address parameterized by user ID equal to one, and you get the address data, right? So you have these resources and you fetch these resources on demand. Now, the problem is that uh, this is uh, terrible for the people who are consuming this API because uh, API integration Right, getting the API is great. That's step one, and that's kind of what we've been talking about. Um, but step two is also integrating this API. And integrating the API into an application, the more number of APIs you have, the more learning you have to do, the more integration work that you have to do, because you just have like many different API calls, right? So imagine that you have like imagine like from the point of view of your API consumer, right? They're building an application, and they need to see like they need to show different portions of data on that screen, right? That they have like this is. The kind of like in, in an application development use case, right? But whatever the API has been used for, you have to make multiple API calls to fetch different parts of the resource. That means you have to learn more about these different APIs. You have to learn, you know, what their syntax is, what the different resources are, uh, and and this is a little bit yuck, right? From the point, if you talk to application developers, um, the fun part of their work is building the application. The not so fun part of their work is uh, is is integrating APIs. But uh, so so so. 
so what you do is whenever you have these multiple REST API endpoints, right? What you usually do is you realize that, hey, I'm making like 10 API calls. Let me, can't I just make one API call that will give me all of this data in one shot? So you go and talk to the API developer and you say, hey, uh, you know, uh, can you, can, instead, of, instead of having two resources, why don't you give me one API endpoint where I can fetch all the data in one shot? So instead of having a slash user endpoint and a slash address endpoint, what if I have a slash user info endpoint? And I get all that data in one shot, right? That's convenient. That's nice. Um, and so there's a little bit of back and forth. Now, if you want this API, you have to go through a change management process. Somebody has to publish a new API endpoint. The whole cycle has to happen again, right? This is a time-consuming process. Um, and, and then, of course, like you, you, it's blocked on actual development work, right? Your API developer goes on vacation. The API developer is like, eh, I don't really want to do this work. Why don't you just make two API calls? Uh, because you know, maybe that API developer doesn't have too much empathy for you as an API consumer. You know, all of, all of these kinds of things happen, like in uh, IRL. So, uh, so, 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 and, and 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 but at the end of the day, you know, you you kind of get that one API endpoint. Fine, right? It takes a little bit of effort, but you get that one API endpoint with the kind of slice of data that you want. Now, you might think that the story ends here and we solve the problem, but actually, that's not the case because what happens frequently. And as uh, API modern, uh, APIs are kind of being used more and more, you realize that APIs are being used in different contexts. And in different contexts, you need different amounts of data. Let's say this API is being used by a web developer or a mobile developer, right? If you're building a web app, you can show more information. If you're building a mobile application, you can you have to show lesser information, right? Um, and, and this is just, again, an app use case, but this could also be for a backend service that's using this API, right? The API, the backend service wants less info, wants more information, right? So if you have one API endpoint that gives you like a 500 KB of information, that's going to be slow and it's going to be too much data, right? What if for that context, you wanted a smaller piece of information, but the control of how much information you want is with the API consumer because the API consumer knows what context they're using the API in, right? Um, and so in this example, I want more data here. I want like street and city and pin code and country and whatnot. I want last 10 addresses, but here I just want to show city because I have less real estate. I don't want to fetch too much data. I want network performance to be good. I don't want to show this information. So, so what do you do now? So now what you do is you go back to your backend developer and you say, hey, why don't you change your API design? so that I can also send you the list of fields that I want. So instead of sending me all of the data in one shot, give me some control to choose what slice of this information I want, right? And so here I'm saying I want ID equal to one, but I want fields, ID, name, and city. And so you get just that piece of data, right? Which is nice. But the problem is that it's again this API design and redevelopment process. You are changing the API design. You're coming up with a new syntax, right? You're using commas to separate. Right? What if you had some special characters here? Would this parsing work? Would it fail? What is the specification here? This is some ad hoc standard that two people have come up with uh, as the API consumer and API developer. But this is, is this going to be standard across all of your APIs in the organization? You know, what's going to happen here? So, so this, is, this is kind of the painful context that we are living in when we have an explosion of APIs uh, and when these APIs are being used in so many use cases that you don't even know what they're being used for. Right? You want to give your API consumer some control, uh, but this is the process that you have to go through. In this context, uh, GraphQL came about as a specification, right? And GraphQL said, hold up. Instead of having 10 different API endpoints, 500 different API endpoints, what if we have one API endpoint? But to that API endpoint, let's send a query. Let's post a query instead of specifying the resource at the API endpoint. Let's post a query. And that query is going to have a really nice syntax for describing what resources I want. So if you see what's happening here, right, the client or the API consumer is making a post request. We're not actually posting data. The post request is just a detail. But this query is being sent as the body. And this query is the GraphQL query. So this query says, I want query user and ID. And so you see that the response only contains ID. If I say user, ID, and name, I'll get that as the response. If I add more fields, I'll get more fields as the response. And this is how I specify the syntax. So it's a new way of solving the same problem that we've been talking about, right? And the advantage here is that I, as the API consumer, can choose what slice of data to fetch, right, without bothering the API development team, right? Which is cool, which is a massive increase in velocity for the people who are building these applications, right? Um, and so if you think about, uh, uh, and so if you think about the cost of this, right, the API service has to understand this new thing called GraphQL. 
right? Um, it's very convenient for the API consumers, right? Because they use a GraphQL client instead of using a REST client, they use a GraphQL client, they send this GraphQL query, it's just a string, right? It's just a post body, not a big deal. You'll get a JSON response, amazing. Uh, the pain is a little bit here where these people have to implement the GraphQL server instead of implementing a REST API server. But that's kind of the context that we are, uh, that, that GraphQL kind of came out in. So the two key insights behind GraphQL. The first key insight behind GraphQL is that actually your API resources are not independent resources. They're actually connected and they're semantically a part of a graph. This is not about it being a graph database or, or you making graph queries, finding like nearest neighbor. It's not, it's not a graph theory problem, right? It's just that semantically real life things are graph like things, right? Because you have a user, the user has an address. If it's an e-commerce situation, the user has orders. If the healthcare situation, the user has records, right? The user has appointments or visits or claims, right? Um, and then uh, in an e-commerce situation, the order itself references a product. The product itself references a brand, right? So you have a graph, your, all of your resources are actually semantically connected into a graph, right? And so the first insight is that your API is actually kind of a graph of resources, not a set of independent resources. So that's the first kind of insight behind GraphQL, right? Um, in fact, really, if you have a bunch of uh, independent resources, they are actually, it's like 10 nodes of a graph at the top level. It's like a disconnected graph of 10 nodes, right? Anyway, it's semantics. Now, two, is that uh, the control of what data is going to be fetched is with the API consumer not with the api producer that's the, that's a, that's a, that's an important thing to understand right it's a it's a a it's a political thing the politics of the api are that the consumer can decide what they want the producer does not control the shape of the data that is sent the producer controls how the data is fetched but not the shape of the data that is sent and this this point in is 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 is, is if, if you think about all of the pros and cons of graphql come from this point the pro greater control, greater flexibility, amazing API, con. How do I think about the performance? How do I think about security? Now that the user is going to uh, ask for what they want, how am I going to build that kind of uh, security and performance, which was easier when I thought about REST APIs, right? So, so there's more thinking now that you have to do. That's a problem. But the advantage is that it's a beautiful API that you know the API developer never has to bother with. Once they set it up, they're done, right? They don't have to create a new API endpoint for everything. So, uh, let's take a look at the syntax of a GraphQL query. This is what a GraphQL query looks like. You say query, you specify the models, right? You say user, which has a field called ID and name, and then you have an address, which has a street, right? So, or a city or whatever, right? So you have, this is a GraphQL query. The stuff in blue that you see here is a part of the GraphQL specification, the syntax itself, right? Um, and the stuff that you see in gray, that's the part of your model, right? So this is a user model that you have. It's an address model that you have, right? It's it's a part of your domain, right? Uh, and they have a structure, right? That's how they're connected. Um, GraphQL, if you just go one level deeper to understand how GraphQL queries actually work, it is not magical at all. It is an extremely, uh, it is exactly what you would expect it to be. Here's an API client, uh, for example, an application, but it could be anybody. It could be a Java service. It could be a human being using Postman. It could be whatever, right? Um, and so uh, this API and the way it works is that I make a post request to an API endpoint that is typically a slash GraphQL. It can be any name, a slash API, whatever. And, and then the content type has to be JSON because you know, there's no content type called GraphQL today. Um, and so in this content type of JSON, I send this body. And the body contains the query string because GraphQL is a new language, right? It's a new, it's a new thing. And so I have to send that as a string. The, the GraphQL server will parse this string and, and it will figure out what you want. It'll say, oh, okay, there's a query. You want user parameterized by ID equal to one. That's cool. And what fields do you want? You want ID and name? All right. So then the server will construct the JSON and then send the JSON back, right? So that's what the actual GraphQL request response looks like. Again, nothing too complicated, fairly straightforward. Um, I talked about GraphQL queries, which help you read data. Let's talk about uh, GraphQL mutations that help you write data. Again, not going to go into too much detail in the interest of time, but just to show you that we cover spec that GraphQL covers a full spectrum of whatever you would do with APIs, right? Typically, let's say you're building a to-do application, right? You have a post endpoint, you say slash to-do, you send it the to-do, right? You say, hey, uh, watch the talk today, right? Uh, and so you say, uh, or, or understand what GraphQL is today, that's my to-do, and you get an ID as a response, right? That's the typical request response if you're writing stuff. And um, ideally, if you're behaving well, you'd use a variety of methods like post for inserting stuff, put for replacing stuff, delete for deleting resources, patch for 
partially updating resources, right? Um, and this is a convention. You must understand this is a convention, right? The server can decide whatever it wants to do. The server can say, uh, the server can expose a delete endpoint that actually goes and does an insert. You have no control. It's a convention that we all agree to that this sequence of characters, which spells D E L E T E, is going to be a delete, right? It's going to have the semantics of a delete. But what it actually does is up to this API service. So this is kind of what the world looks like with, uh, with a REST endpoint. The way it looks like with the GraphQL endpoint is that instead of using the keyword query, we use the keyword mutation because we are mutating our resources, right? So we're saying mutation add to do. So like a query, you say mutation. And now instead of having uh, predefined keywords, the meaning of what your API does is embedded in that name of the API, right? So you say add to do, delete to do, update to do, that is exposed by the API developer. So instead of having post delete put patch, as methods, right? So instead of having a insert mutation, delete mutation, update mutation, GraphQL as a specification just says, hey, you have a mutation and you call it whatever you want. Give that action a name. Give that action a name that is that makes sense to you, right? As, as the developers and consumers of an API, right? Um, and then there's support for something called GraphQL query variables, which allows you to embed JSON inside the GraphQL query, right? So I have a GraphQL query here that says this is a mutation, add to do, and what is the object? And this is the JSON object, right? So you send, so whenever you make a request, you'll say post GraphQL, you'll send the GraphQL query, and you'll also send the JSON object. And this GraphQL query can reference this JSON object that is going to be uh, used inside this mutation, right? So that way you don't have to do string concatenation and insert this JSON inside the GraphQL query and stuff like that. So that's kind of what a GraphQL mutation looks like. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I'm gonna to come to something very exciting, which is this notion of real-time APIs. So let's say, for example, uh, we have something on the back end, right? Like there's some data that's changing on the back end, and we have um, again in this e-commerce like situation, uh, because it's just an easy example to talk about, right? Let's say you have orders and the status changes, right? Payment becomes true, where delivery happens. And this is asynchronous real life things, right? Uh, it's not like it's gonna take a few milliseconds for this change to happen. These are async. We are moving our entire our, all our back end systems are moving towards becoming asynchronous, decoupled, fault tolerant systems, right? So what happens is that events happen and things get updated. Now, what API consumers want is they want to be notified when changes happen, right? That's what you want to do. You want to say, I want to subscribe to these changes. Um, and so in, in an application development scenario, let's say I have an application UI. If this payment value changes to true, I want to show a little tick mark, right? If this dispatch changes to true, I want to show a little tick mark, right? I, that's, the, that's the end user experience I want to provide by consuming this API. But this API needs to have a real time facility. Now, in the previous world, you have two options today. If you have, if you want to implement this kind of a system, you have two options. As an API consumer, you can say, let's poll. Let's make a request every X seconds to refetch data. This is okay, it's not a problem. The problem is that there are two problems. One, I mean, the, the first problem is that it's, it's I, I call it yuck. I mean, like, I mean, it's 2020, right? Like it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel good, right? Uh, that's that's the problem. But apart from that, there's a real problem where you might start hitting API limits, right? Uh, you might be overloading this API system. Uh, you might be making like too many requests that are not actually doing anything useful because you're just polling for. The second is to implement web sockets, which is that the server and the client both implement web sockets to push and pull data. Now, web sockets have been around for ten years as a part of the HTTP standard, but it's still a nightmare. It's still a nightmare to build and integrate. It's not fun. Right? It's 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 nice that it's sort of at a protocol level, but it's really not fun to build and use. So what GraphQL says is, hey, let's use WebSockets, but let's not expose WebSockets to the API consumer. Let's call it a subscription. So we had query, mutation, subscription. And every GraphQL client will wrap over the WebSocket experience. So you don't have to deal with WebSockets. You don't have to deal with reconnects, dropped events, missing events. You don't deal with that. You just deal with this GraphQL query, which now has a subscription keyword, and you say, I want to subscribe to this particular order, right? I want order ID 57, uh, give me this data. Whenever this data changes, you will get the latest JSON payload that will give you this information. And now you can use this JSON whenever this event comes to you to do whatever you need to do, right? Whether it's update an application, whether it's you know, use that event for doing something else. So GraphQL supports queries, mutations, and subscriptions for reading, updating, or writing to data, and then obviously for, um, for subscribing to events as well. So fairly modern API, great developer experience, right? Um, one of the key things that makes GraphQL so popular with API consumers um, is is this is the process of is is how GraphQL manages to circumvent the process of sharing APIs. Let's talk about that a little bit. 
Um, what you have is a situation where you know your API developer builds an API, then they write the documentation for their API. I'm using a red box because people don't do this. They'll build the API, they think they've done their work, and they they don't write documentation. Right? This is bad. This is not good. Um, and I mean, depending on how much they care about you, they might send you some documentation in like a, hey, here's an Excel sheet that contains the API example, right? Or here's a Postman collection, or here's a full Swagger specification, right? Depending on how hardcore uh, your team is and how invested your team is in doing this. Um, but but this is a painful process, right? You feel like this was the hard work. You're like, why am I doing this work, right? Um, and then as an API consumer, you read the documentation. Again, notice the red box. Uh, uh, the problem with documentation is that people don't write it well, and people also don't read the docs, right? It's like, go read the docs. Uh, but people also don't do that. Um, and, and then when you start actually integrating the API, right? by the time you finish integrating the API, you realize, hey, these docs, they're out of date. They're missing. They're wrong, right? It's, it's just, you're just like you're pained by this time. You're like, I was supposed to get the Boolean value of true. It's sending me a string called capital T-R-U-E because they didn't do Python deserialization or serialization correctly, which is something, right, in their API code, whatever, right? It's painful. You have to match all the types. You have to figure out what the spec of the type is, right? Is it date? Is it ISO 8601? Is it a timestamp? What is it? Is it an integer? Is it a string? What if the integer is really large? Is it encoded as a string? All of these things you have to figure out, right? This makes this process inconvenient. GraphQL circumvents this process so that developers build the API, consumers start integrating the API. All of this tooling is not manual. This tooling is automated which makes GraphQL amazing to work with, right? And that's kind of the secret behind how GraphQL, despite being more complicated than REST as an implementation, right, became extremely popular. It's become very popular with API consumers because they really like the experience of, you know, not having to deal with this stuff, right? And just direct, directly go to integrating the API. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, the how and give you a demo of how this works. But at the heart of the GraphQL thing is something about a GraphQL schema, which is like a type which is like a type system that describes your API. So it basically describes this, what these types are, what is an integer, what is a string, how are they connected? Think of it like a open API specification or a JSON schema specification, but in a slightly different syntax, right? And that, that syntax is able to absorb relationships, right? So I can say address is an address type, address type contains this, right? So you're able to kind of represent these relationships. So that's the heart of the GraphQL uh, schema. Uh, every GraphQL server supports something called introspection. So not only can you ask the GraphQL query to fetch the data, you can ask the GraphQL query a meta question and say, hey, what types do you have? And the GraphQL server will return the types to you. So it's every GraphQL service can simultaneously support introspecting while it supports the actual data as well, right? And of course, you can turn the introspection API off production and expose it only to developers, whatever you want to do and whatever is right for you. But uh, this introspection API makes GraphQL very powerful and makes it possible for us to build so much automation and amazing tooling around GraphQL. All right, so to quickly recap GraphQL benefits. GraphQL is nice because uh, I get a great API consumption experience. Uh, I can build applications faster if I'm using that to integrate with apps, but also if it's a platform and a data-centric use case, I get to publish APIs better, right? So I get to I get to browse the API better. It's more semantic, it's more connected. I have better understanding of the domain as opposed to looking at 10 different API endpoints. Each of them may be returning the same model, but slightly different variations of the data. I can now instead look at the graph and decide what slice of the graph I want to consume. Right. Um, the challenges with adding GraphQL are whether well, developer challenges. It's a new thing, which is a big problem because every time something is a new thing, it's painful. Uh, it's painful for everybody involved, right? Um, uh, and and for legitimate reason, change is change is not fun, right? And it's a big it's a big change. Um, there's performance concerns, there's security concerns because you have to change the way that you think. You've given two. You've given more control to the API consumer than you have before. Uh, and then, of course, there are operational challenges. How does monitoring work? How do health checks work? How does distributed tracing work, which becomes more important in a GraphQL context than anything else, right? Um, and so then these are kinds of the challenges uh, that you have with GraphQL, right? So pros and cons. Now, uh, I'm going to quickly talk about the Hasura approach in the few minutes that I have left. Um, what Hasura does is Hasura says, hey, all of these people who want to build things need access to data that are in several places, right? Data can be inside databases, uh, data can be inside SaaS services. They need this access to data and you have to build this API. And for exactly the reasons that we talked about, building this API in the middle, especially if you're accessing legacy stuff, like you have thousands of tables, billions of records, right? It's painful. 
if you want to API find that and give that access to consumers. It's going to take you a few quarters to do this, right? Um, and it's going to take you a few quarters because there's a lot of work to do. You have to figure out how to map these data models into the API models. You have to figure out relationships, authorization rules, security rules, compliance. Um, if you if you want to solve real time and reactive, right? You want to capture change events here and ship them over the API, you're screwed, basically, right? It's a tremendous amount of work. And then you have non-functional work to do. Your NFRs around caching and tracing and scalability, right? You want to move this to containers, but this stuff is not on containers, right? Like, obviously, it's stateful. How do I connect to them? How do I handle connection pooling? It's work. It's work when you're going to expose this as an API, because when you expose something as a web API, you can have 100,000 people connecting to this API. It needs to be scalable, right? And so you need to make sure you solve that problem. So what the Hasura approach is that Hasura kind of automates this, provides a GraphQL API for all the reasons that we talked about, but automates this process of you doing the mapping and makes it convenient to create authorization rules and relationships um, so that you can activate this legacy data, expose that over a GraphQL API. And because it's a GraphQL server, it takes care of these non-functional requirements uh, around scalability, tracing, uh, caching uh, that you would have had to build by hand, right? That's kind of where Hasura fits into the stack. That's it. Let's get into a super quick demo of what Hasura looks like. Before that, I'm just going to do a quick time check and see how much time we have. Do, 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 do. All right, no questions here. So let me switch over to my Firefox window uh, and show you an example of what Hasura looks like. All right, cool. So um, let me uh, load this here. OK, so what I have is this is what the Hasura UI looks like, right? And what the Hasura UI has is this is the GraphQL endpoint. This is the API endpoint. Let me zoom this a little bit. Right? And here is the uh, GraphQL API endpoint. Um, and this is a window where we're going to make our GraphQL queries. We're going to get responses here, kind of like a postman. These are my request headers, right? I also have an existing database. I have an existing database that has these tables in it, right? What I want to do is I want to be able to convert this information. I want, I want to expose these tables in my database over a GraphQL API. Imagine that these are thousands instead of just being tens, right? So what Hasura lets me do is automate this, and I can say I, I want to convert all of these tables into API models. And just to show you what this looks like and the database that I'm looking at, I'm looking at a simple database. It's a music database, right? There's artists and albums, and albums have tracks and stuff like that. It's a simple relational schema, uh, and I have the system here, right? So um, Hasura kind of introspects these tables and says, I understand what all of these tables are doing, and I'm going to convert all of them into uh, GraphQL API models. Hasura goes one step further and says, all of these tables also have foreign keys. Are they GraphQL relationships? We're like, yes, all of them are GraphQL relationships. Please uh, give us, uh, you know, please convert it into a graph. Connect all of these into a graph as well, and you know, make my life easy. Um, it is not necessary for your data to have foreign keys and whatnot. It can also be completely like uh, uh, defined uh, at the metadata level. But as soon as I do that, what I get is, I get to be able to make a GraphQL query to fetch all of the albums in my API. So I'm making a request here to fetch all the albums. That's kind of cool, right? I can make fairly advanced queries. I can say I want to fetch all of the albums where the title has the word uh, rock in it, because you know it's the APs again. Um, let me switch this to rock, right? So I can make these kind of GraphQL queries, right? And I can start fetching this data. I can also start making nested queries, right? So I can say I want all of those albums that have the word rock in it, but I also want to fetch the artist that created this album. And so now I'm making this query, right? And I'm fetching, well, here's the art, here's the album, here's the artist, right? And so I'm fetching this data, and I can limit this to a smaller set. I, mean, I don't want to fetch so much information, but let me limit it to 10. That's pagination taken care of. I can offset it by 10 as well. Uh, so that I can keep uh, paging it through this data, right? So instead of me having to build this API with billions of records, thousands of tables, right? We're kind of bootstrapping this process so that people can start consuming a nice API, decide what they want to do. This is really nice to uh, analyze as well because you can see the underlying query that Hasura itself makes, give this off to your DBA, tell them that you need to improve a few indexes and whatnot, look at the actual plan and stuff like that. You can customize this query as well uh, so that uh, so that Hasura is kind of doing your thing for your database, right? Um, I want to show you a quick example of some authorization uh, kind of use cases, right? Let's say, for example, I have this uh, situation where I would like to restrict what who has access to what data. So I can create a role called user, and I can say they have permissions only to select uh, data where you know they are the owner of that data. So where ID is equal to you know something like your Okta ID or SSO ID or or 
or, or so something that's coming in from your authentication service. And you choose what columns. So you have row level access and column level access control. And as soon as you create these permissions, right, what you can do is you can uh, enable those permissions. Let me go in and say x customer role user and x customer user ID is one. So as soon as I do that, you'll see that I don't get to query albums anymore, right? Because I haven't released access to that. And if I query for the artist, I'm only going to get artist ID one, right? If I change this to 10, I'm only going to get artist ID 10. I'm not able to get all of that data that I had previously because I've set up a very fine grained access control that you would have usually had to write code for. Um, let's take another quick example yeah. of- Tanamai, Tanamai, we are kind of five minutes late already. Oh, uh, all right, got it. Um, yeah. I'll just wrap up in a minute then? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, awesome. Um, so, all right, cool. So one last thing that uh, I wanted to show you, which I'm not going to show you, I don't have time for, is that you can also kind of join data across the database and APIs like Stripe, because we were talking about Stripe previously. And so here I'm making an API call where this data is coming from my database, but I'm joining that with safeguards coming in from Stripe. And so Hustler can automate that piece as well, which is a really good fit for GraphQL because your graph itself is split across data sources and services that already exist, right? Um, cool. I'm going to stop here. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, on Twitter. I am uh, Tanmay on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions about Hustler and GraphQL. And uh, do check out uh, our uh, virtual booth. And we have uh, a bunch of resources uh, online on Hustler.com as well. So just search for Hustler.com. And you see a bunch of uh, talks from people in fintech and healthcare talking about API modernization, legacy data activation, and how uh, they were able to accelerate their API journey and accelerate their data journey. So uh, uh, feel free to check those out and reach out to me if you have any questions. Sorry for going a little bit over time, and uh, hope this was useful to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Tanmay. Uh, on your booth, I will stop by to ask you the question on, let's say, how culturally company are are ready or not to just transform legacy systems into GraphQL APIs. I think, yeah, they need to be prepared, but it can be a powerful tool uh, either. So yeah, glad to discuss exactly. on that. Thank you very awesome. much.